moms. Thanks for joining. I have an incredible guest for us today, April Odom. First, the mission of To Mom is to Love is to support, encourage, and empower each other as imperfect moms to love as a verb. Join us and subscribe, share, and follow. Welcome to our community. I am thrilled to have April on the podcast with me today. April J. Odom is a DNP, FNP, with full practice authority in the state of Illinois. April is a wife, mother, and a nurse with a passion for mentoring future nurse leaders. She is a true pioneer who guides entrepreneurs, aspiring nurses, and experienced healthcare professionals. Thank you so much for being with us here today, April. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Valerie. Absolutely. I saw all of your amazing conferences that you had planned for Nurse Practitioner Week this last year, and I attended a bunch of events, and just you're so incredible, so inspiring. I'm like, I need to have her on my podcast to talk about everything that she does and for nurses in the healthcare field. Thank you. Yes. It's, yeah. NP Week was amazing. I'm still like on high on a high from it. <laughs> yes. Can you tell our listeners a bit about NP Week? So I I had this crazy idea last year that I wanted to do something for NP Week. Because you know, we have Nurses Week, but you know, we're nurses, yes, but it's like we have our, a week for a reason. <laughs> so yeah. I really wanted to have a, this week for NPs to celebrate NPs. And part of it, I think, was because as an entrepreneur, I'm, you know, it's just me right now uh, in my business. And it gets lonely sometimes. You don't have anybody to bounce ideas off of and no one to talk to another colleague, should I say. You know, I have staff, but it's not another MP here with me. Uh, and I feel like that community is so important. And and then sometimes, you know, you're giving to patients, giving to patients, take care of patients, and you feel like you're not receiving anything. So, you know, you feel lonely and just like worn out. And so I was like, I really wanted to do something to appreciate it, peace. Mm-hmm. And that was just all I wanted to do. I just wanted to have this week long of events. I was like, nobody's ever done this before because I know we have MP week, but we don't have a week to celebrate us like every yeah. single day. And that's just what I wanted to do. And I threw the idea out there. I had a few people that jumped on my crazy train with me <laughs> and we really pulled it off. And we had eight events in seven days. Mm. It's really amazing. It's amazing. I it was it really it was incredible, and I think that it like you're saying it was just a week to celebrate what we do and to meet other people and to see what we're doing for our patients and for the community. And it was just a great a great time. Yeah, and especially just to let us know that we have each other. Yeah. That was the biggest takeaway. Like you have support. You know, there's this big stigma about nurses eating their young, but we don't. Mm. <laughs> we we don't. Like we want to support each other. And so just bringing us together to create that support system was one of the big, biggest things. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that that is so important. I feel like when I started nursing school and being a young nurse and all of that, there was this like kind of stigma, I guess, of this, yeah, you have to eat your young, you have like, you just get ready, like to deal with all of that. And I'm so glad over the past like decade and more than decade now that you know, we are starting to evolve a bit and embrace this community of women and of nurses and nurse practitioners and help each other out, support each other. That's, that's a great, great reminder. And I'm glad that we're getting there. Um, in our profession. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Now, April, so you are a mom and also an entrepreneur, and I wanted to talk with you about what it's like to be both. And if you have any advice for moms out there who are thinking of doing something with entrepreneurship with either in the healthcare field or something separate too. Uh, well, yeah, so I, I'm definitely a mom first. So I've actually been a mom for 20, my son, my oldest son will be 23 next month. Uh, so, you know, I was a young mom and I worked, I worked forever. My son always says, you're the hardest working woman I know. <laughs> um, you know, at nurses, we do more than one thing. Yeah. Um, I have always wanted more. You know, I'm a first generation college graduate student. Uh, neither of my parents went to college, uh, so I was the first. And so I just wanted, you know, you always want more for your kids than you had. 
Mm-hmm. And so that was one of my my key things that I just wanted more. And I knew that I didn't want to work on someone else's job forever. So I've always, in a way, had an entrepreneur mindset. Um, my my best friend and I, actually, who's a nurse, we had a CNA school for 10 years, um, back from 2010 to 2020. And um, we, we had CPS students. We were in Chicago area. We did really great. It was just at the wow. time when it ended, we lost our our lease. Our Layla was selling the building. So we had to like, mm. sell the building. And I was out south. She was up north. And it just kind of wasn't, didn't make sense for us to continue. And so we just kind of let it go. But we did that for a while. And that was all while working a full-time job still. So. Wow. Um, and That's then, awesome. Yeah, it was, it was so great. Because again, teaching the future generation is, been always my thing. It's like bringing because these people are going to be taking care of us someday, and we want good quality nurses out here. <laughs> uh, yeah. so that's important. And I'm sorry, I didn't answer your question. Because I oh it. no, you're fine. No, and and that was a lovely answer. I mean, I feel like yes, like we're always moms first, but we also have other aspects of our lives and passions that we have. And I love that you have that passion to educate future nurses and healthcare. And um, how do you how do you balance that? Because it is hard. I feel like for me, um, I don't know, like I have this crazy paper calendar that I'm constantly crossing things off of. And like when I look at it, I'm like, oh my gosh, it was all these to-do lists. And I don't have like all these other things that you're doing while running your business. Um, and how do you juggle all of that? How do you like make yourself um, you know, not um, not too stressed <laughs> out, I guess? <laughs> uh, well, I do. I use I use Google Calendar. It's like if it's not on the calendar, it's not getting done. Uh, uh-huh. And again, kids are older, so it's a little bit easier. But um, I work, you know, during the day so that I can be home at night. And that's one thing about being an entrepreneur. I like I don't have to work seven to seven anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, so mm-hmm. I can cook dinner every night and I cook dinner mostly Sunday through Thursday. Uh, sometimes I'll cook two meals on Sunday so I don't have to cook on Monday, but I cook four or five days a week and then we eat out on the weekend. So usually we'll go out on the weekends, but I'm, I'm home most nights unless I'm at a meeting or something, but I'm home most nights. Uh, I go to my son's basketball games on the weekends. Uh, we'll sit and watch a movie on the weekends, you know, so I make that time for family and then yeah. off time is when I'm working or when I'm in the office, I try to do all my work. Or when I go home and my son's doing his homework, I'll do some work. <laughs> so mm-hmm. we have some time together. And then my husband and I, we still do date night uh, at least once a month. Awesome. So we have to make the time. And that's what I yeah. love about entrepreneurs that you can make that time. Mm. Um, sometimes you're like, oh, this is just going to wait till tomorrow. <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's great advice. Now, can you tell us about your practice and um, a little bit more about Physicals Plus? Yes. Yeah, so Physicals Plus started and actually started in 2017. I was going to do physical exams for sports, physicals, and school physicals. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of where the name came from. And I was like, okay, I'll just do some sports physicals. Mm-hmm. I did have a full-time job. And after a year, I was like, well, what else can I do with this company? I was like, well, since I'm already working in primary care, I can do some, you know, acute care stuff. So UTI treatments and things like that. So I started to do a little more things, but I've always been in prevent, been big into preventive health. So yeah. I was like, well, why can I incorporate that? So I started to doing some research. I got uh, really versed in like vitamin therapy. So I was doing IV hydration, B12 injections weight management, so lifestyle modification, race management, not just med, race management. And I just continued to add things on. And then when the pandemic came, right before the pandemic, actually, I was like, oh, maybe I should get credential with insurances. And I got credential with Medicare first and then Blue Cross. And the t- pandemic happened in February 2020, right? Uh, or March 2020. And I was talking to my grandmother who was um you know she was she's a senior she was saying this physician wanted to do a a telehealth visit and she didn't understand and she didn't know she doesn't have a camera and I was like that's where the need is so in April of 20 I started doing house calls for seniors because I knew there were seniors out there like my grandmother who couldn't get out who didn't have COVID and they needed to see someone in person yeah <laughs> that yeah. is a big part of my business so I do house calls a couple days a week I have a brick and mortar location where I offer primary care, weight management, 
a vitamin injection. Uh, so I do a little bit of every and some spa services too. So I do some Botox and stuff too. So I do. I, my goal is to be a comprehensive health and wellness clinic with in a no waiting environment. So I have no wait in my office. You're not waiting in the waiting room for 20 minutes before you see the provider. Mm, that's incredible. And I actually was just thinking about this April, where I just. Healthcare itself. I mean, we could have like a whole episode about just healthcare and all the issues that um, the system has right now. But your practice is really helping us move forward in what is needed. Like we, we need more support like that. And like you're saying with your grandma and house calls, like I remember the other day I was trying to schedule an appointment with a specialist and like one, one, um, one practice said it'll take a couple months and the other practice would say a couple weeks and just stuff like that where it's like can I, to be able to have like an advocate um, and feel like they're approachable, that they can talk with them and um, be able to meet them where they're at because patients – don't necessarily know, I think, sometimes how to be an agent for themselves. Some people do, but not everyone does. And that's up to us nurses and nurse practitioners to help with that. And especially when you're going in the home, I tell people this should, it should definitely be a specialty um, mm. because you're looking a different side of the patient. You're in their environment. So yeah. when you're in their home. Uh, you get to see more, you get to learn more. They open up, I feel like, more. And then you have more time with them. You know, these eight-minute clinic visits that you have is not it's not it. <laughs> so Yes. Yes. It's a, so much more than just quantity. Healthcare is so uh so much of it's based on trust too. And I I, I don't know how I can Build trust if it's so um, quick, like just one hand's on the door and it's like, okay, I got to get to the next one and the next one. It's just, um, I love how you are making, paving your own road, which is incredible. Yeah. And that's what, that was one of the things when I, when I started to really think about what model I wanted to have, I wanted to be sure that I wasn't just a meal. I didn't want to just see 40, 50 patients a day because again, you can't provide quality care. So if me being an entrepreneur means I can practice healthcare my way and I'm only seeing six to eight patients a day, but I'm getting to know my patients, my patients trust me, they're sending their families to me because they trust me to care for them, then that's more valuable to me than all the yes. money I can make, you know. Um, that, that's, that's how we're going to, like you said, move forward and change things, change Absolutely. the face of healthcare by listening to patients. I had a patient who had a, a really bad, she went to a clinic, they gave her a bad diagnosis, but the way they gave it to her, it took her 22 months to see someone else. Oh my because gosh. She, I think it was just a whole experience. And then when she came to me and she was explaining, she was like, yeah, I just didn't like how they gave me this information. And so I just didn't go back. Mm. And that, that was one thing I'm like, that is horrible. Like nobody should have to go through that, you know, because you didn't like your experience. So you, you know, risk your health. It, yeah. you know, it's, it's so sad. <laughs> Yes, yes, that's yes. I I'm so proud of what you're doing cuz it really it's so important. It you know and recently I was reading um cuz it would be a shout out. I think it's to Sarah DeGregio. Is her name? She wrote this incredible book. Um uh call to call to action or some no, it's not that. Anyway, I'll edit it out and put in <laughs> the name of it. But um Sarah writes about how nursing itself is so much more than what we this traditional model is, like this Nightingale model. And we hear about this in nursing school and not to diminish what Nightingale has done, but there's so much more to us than just this traditional, let's take orders, let's do this this way. And it's, it's, that's always the way it's been done. So let's continue to do it this way. And thinking outside of the box is so important and meeting patients where they are, like in the home. Um, she had mentioned in her book, in the grocery store, which I thought was kind of cool. And like just things like that, where it's like, we can educate in all sorts of ways. And that's what's so powerful as us nurses and to embrace that power and to continue to help others and support each other along the way, I think is just amazing. Yes, for sure. Like I, that's been like a big thing. And that's why I really wanted to be, I'm like, why can't I be a one-stop shop? Yeah. 
care of people at home. I can take care of people in the clinic. I can give them their acute care, their primary care, their wellness. <laughs> like I can give them everything. Mm. Uh, so that's what I really, really love that I can do that my way as a healthcare provider. That's great. Now, April, I know in the state of Illinois, we have full practice authority um, where you are able to do, you are able to open up your own clinic. Um, but in certain states, that's not the case. Can you talk with us a bit about what it's like to have full practice authority? And if we're, if our listeners are not in a state with that, how can we advocate for that? Or how can we work uh, with nursing organizations and legislation to make that difference? Uh, well, so I'm going to start by saying, um, one, if you're in Illinois and you are an, an APRN and you don't have full practice authority, you absolutely need it. Uh, we were just able to have this in the beginning, 2019. And according to AAMP, which is American Academy of Nurse Practitioners, um, we were not able to have, we are technically still a reduced practice state because we do have a few stipulations in our practice act where we have to have we're not 100% practice. Um, but April, sorry, can you repeat that one more time? It kind of cut out for a second, just when you say the the um, the um stipulations. Sure. So um, as opposed to AANP, we are reduced practice state because we have a few stipulations in our practice act where if we're doing schedule two opioids or more than 120 days of benzodiazepines, we have to have a consultant. Mm. Uh, so we're technically not full practice per A and P okay. rules, but in Illinois, we do have full practice licenses. So that means uh, I don't write for Schedule Two opioids, and I hardly write for benzodiazepines. So technically, I have full practice. Now, if I needed to give somebody Schedule Two opioids, I would have to have a consulting physician, mm. and that we're, that's the, the barrier that we need to kind of get rid of. So the states yeah. that don't have full practice right now, the way that, you know, again, it took I, I our state organization and our lobbyists years to fight for this because you have to, you know, take it to the legislators, you know, create, a, put it, put it in a bill and hopefully get that bill passed. And each year we continue to try to make gains uh, against, you know, try to reduce something, take something up or chip away, they say. And so yeah. if you are in a state where there's not full practice, talk to your legislators, definitely get involved in your state organization and find out who your lobbyist is, because those are the people who are going to be going to bat for you and finding out how can we get these things moving. Um, then that's the only way to do it, because the, you know, the med medical society when whatever state is probably, you know, they're going to have their um, concerns. And so they're fighting against it. So they don't they don't think nurse practitioners should have full practice authority uh, because we're not, you know, we didn't go to medical school, but I always tell people I'm not a, a physician. I didn't go to medical school. I'm a nurse and I, I do advanced nursing and that's what I do. I'm not practicing medicine. I'm practicing advanced nursing. I, I try not to say practice. I'm providing care mm -hmm. as an advanced practice nurse. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not practicing anything, but yeah. um, and so that's where we have to kind of get a, a, away from is that we have went to school. We have these master's degrees. We have these doctor degrees. And we should be working to the full extent of our licenses. Most times we're doing that anyway, right? We just have this piece of paper <laughs> that says you have a collaborative physician. And that's all it is. Because sometimes you don't even collaborate with that physician. Uh, they are not all the times looking at your charts or giving you feedback. You're working independently from day one a lot of times. So you're doing the work anyway. Uh, so we should definitely have that ability to practice to the full extent of our license without any barriers. Mm, absolutely. Now, April, what professional organizations do you recommend and um, what benefits are there? I mean, obviously, this benefit of helping our profession. Um, are there any other benefits to joining a professional organization? So definitely for APRNs, um, I would say ISAPN. Uh, which is Illinois Society for Advanced Practice Nursing. So that is our state in Illinois organization for all APRN. So not just nurse practitioners, but midwives, uh, uh, certified registered nurse anesthetists, and clinical nurse specialists. So they advocate for all four specialty areas of APRN practice. And so each time, and not just advocating for us to get things, 
but advocating, you know, for things that may harm us. So they are going to bat for, you know, something may be a physician, the Med Society or pharmacy introduces a bill that may harm us. So, we, you know, they're fighting for those bills, too, so that we are not losing parts of our practice or things like that. So uh, so they're advocating and fighting for us, you know, in our in our legislative arenas all the time. Mm. So that's definitely one of the benefits. And then again, to have that community of your colleagues, of your like minded individuals where you can, you know, hey, I know somebody that works in pulmonology. Let me call them up because <laughs> I have this patient case I need to talk through with someone. And 90 percent of the time I'm going to call a NP colleague before I call a physician colleague anyway. <laughs> so, you know, just to have that community as well. And then networking is always very important, you know. Networking, getting to know people in different areas and what they're doing is another great thing as well. Mm. Uh, and of course, CE, we're up for license renewal this year. Uh, so being part of ISAPN, we have a lot of uh, CE perks or free uh, continuing education hours that we can get that we don't you know, have to worry about. How, do we have enough to renew our license? So those are some of the benefits for sure. And then being in leadership. Uh, I've been a, a member of ISAPN since I was a student. Uh, I've been on the board for six years and I've grown, I've met people, I've done things within the state. Like I was on the, the task force for the uh, practitioner for life sustaining order. So the post forms, um, and I've been on different things. So it opens up so many more things by being a leadership in your, or being a leader in your organization. Mm. That's all great points. It opens up doors that you didn't know existed. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, that's great. Now, April, um, We had touched base on this earlier, but I want just to talk a little bit more about why you think it's important to educate future nursing leaders. Well, one, they're the future. Yeah. (laughs) That's the first thing. Yeah. (laughs) They are, you know, going to be the ones out here being the innovators, uh, being the care providers. And so I had an amazing mentor when I was actually, when I was the CNA, I had an amazing mentor. She was an RN. And I always say, I always say, some people they see the leadership potential in you before you even do. Mm, <laughs> so they mm-hmm. push you, and you know, you're like, oh, why are you? But it's like they push you because they know what you can do. And so, um, this mentor, she was everything. She taught me so many things. And uh, when I was an RN, she became the nurse manager, and she taught me all of those things. You know, it was just such a great thing to see. And I've always big been on, okay, I have to pay it forward. And so, being able to, hey, let me t- tag somebody else. So that I could help them the way that she helped me has always been like my one of my driving forces is I have to help the next pe- person along. I have to show them that they can do this. I have to help them get there <laughs> uh, because, you know, again, one day, you know, we're not going to be here. There'll be the future people. And we want to make sure that when we are creating the future nurses and nurse leaders, that they are, again, better than us. <laughs> like I said about my kids, I want you to don't be just like me, but be better than me. Do things different than I did. Because we don't want things to stay the same. We want things to grow. So, Mm, I love that. It's like mentors, it makes me think of, I sometimes will talk about like a pebble in the pond and our actions creating ripple effects. And it's kind of like with mentors too, like how you were saying she saw something in you that you didn't see yet in yourself. And she created that, that confidence and that help Mm -hmm. and support. And then those ripples and now you're doing the same thing. And it's, that's amazing. And I think the more we can do that in our profession, the more beautiful we can create this awesome nurse community that I think can not only help ourselves, it will also help the world, like healthcare and everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know. I tell people sometimes because I love being a nurse, but sometimes it's hard. Yeah. (laughs) Like, you know, it's it's a lot to take on. You know, you have patients dying, you have, you know, hard cases, things that stress you out that nobody understands but another nurse. <laughs> you know, it's, yes. it gets hard sometimes. And so you definitely have to have that support. Absolutely. That brings me to a point. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I think that the conversation is starting a bit. Um, but like trauma in healthcare. And I feel like I experienced it more so. I mean, I'm a nurse practitioner, but I also, you know, was in the NICU and all that as a, as a mom. And so I experienced a bit of that trauma response afterwards, but I've talked to other nurses and that 
you know, especially like post COVID and all that type of stuff, that this is also a thing like it as providers, like there are traumatic situations that we don't necessarily, um, I feel like are given the space to talk about and work through. And, um, I'm glad that you mentioned having that community to talk through that. That is so important. Um, are there any other things that you would recommend for nurses to do if they, they kind of want to work through that trauma a bit, or, you know, like there's just so much stuff we see and, um, that we can't just push it under the rug. And I feel like sometimes the system wants us to do that. I remember when I was in nursing school, like they used to always be like, no matter what's bothering you, you leave it at the door mm. because the patients were more important. So you had to internalize a lot of things you were feeling or that's, you know, kind of how I got it because, you know, of course the patient doesn't care if I had a bad night last night and, you know, I can't show sure. that, I did that, but it's like, we just take these things in and we oftentimes don't let it out again. And so ways one of letting it out is, when I was my first position where my mentor was, that was the best place I had ever worked. I worked in inpatient rehab at Masonic and our unit, it was just the environment of our, we made it like a family. So no matter how hard the day was, we can, we laughed, <laughs> we ate ice cream, you know, like we just made it like, okay, we're, we're having, we talked so much. We talked about everything, you know, we laughed and we joked and we played around, but we did the work. You know, so it was just the environment was just such an amazing environment where, you know, we were able to de stress basically, no matter how hard the day was. It's like, okay, come, you got to come help me, you know, like, hey, you've been sitting too long, you know, and we could say that to each other and just work together. It was nobody's getting an attitude or nobody's like, I'm not helping you today. It was never like that. Our unit was just, it was such an amazing unit. That was Mm -hmm. like one of the best positions I ever had. But that helped. So having that, you know, that colleague that, that uh, experience of where you can say, hey, get off your butt, come help me turn this patient. And the person just gets up and come without any attitude. And that's just the environment we have. Or you can laugh at the end of the day or, you know, whatever, that helps. So finding a way to release that stress, whether it's, you know, laughing, joking, dancing. (laughs) We would dance sometimes. Um, And then, of course, people never be afraid to talk to some professional. You know, it's one thing when you're talking to your friends and you're talking to your colleagues, but sometimes you just want to, you have to let that stuff off of your chest and give it to somebody else because, you know, holding those things in is never good for you or anyone else. Uh, so letting those things go and not letting things ruin your day or your, you know, your mood, that's definitely another big one. Like always learn how to just let it go and breathe. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I love that. All that advice. Thank you, April. No, April, I love on your website, you say in healthcare, we treat the sickest, but our goal should be to promote wellness. And I just wanted to talk with you briefly about just the importance of primary prevention and education. I know we touched base on that earlier, but I just think it's so important to kind of talk some more about for everyone. Yeah. So I, you know, in, in, in life, we as people, we're more reactive than proactive, right? We wait till there's a problem mm-hmm. and then we want to fix the problem. And so I'm trying to get people to understand, hey, if you get your annual exams and your annual labs early in your 20s, you know, early on, we can possibly catch something before it becomes a problem. So that way we can work on it now. And now you're not 45 and now you just find that you, your A1C is 10, whereas, you know, you have diabetes. But let's like see if you're on the borderline, what can we do to, you know, reverse that and change that. And and it's possible. It's just about lifestyle. And so trying to get people to really put in the work. I sometimes use the analogy with patients, you know, your body's like a car engine. You can put the wrong stuff in it and it's going to work until the moment it doesn't, right? You don't feel anything. and But then when it poops out, oh, you feel it then. And that's the same thing with your body. Mm-hmm. We're exposed to so many toxic things every day. Yeah, You know, and our food is, should be nutritious, but unfortunately it's not. <laughs> uh, you know, we're missing so many vital nutrients in our foods and, you know, we're exposed to other things that's causing damage to ourselves. And so we have to be proactive in finding ways to combat that. And that begins with primary prevention, annual exams, vitamin. I'm big on taking your vitamins. It's, you know, that's what our cells need. Uh, and just, you know, once a year, definitely keeping a once a year appointment where you're checking in with your provider, getting your labs, even if you feel great, that's great. That's where we want you to stay. And so that's, that's the importance of that. Yeah, absolutely. I love the car analogy. 
That one's great. And it, it is so much like a car. Like we have to like schedule those maintenance yeah. Like, because yeah, otherwise one day it <laughs> we don't feel nothing until, until it's too late. <laughs> yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's a great analogy. Now, April, as we wrap up here, I want to give you the opportunity to share with our listeners where they can find you, um, anything that you have planned, like if you have uh, and P week, if they're, if that's coming up again, I'd um, love to hear more about all of that. Yes. Yeah, so I, I have my own website. So it's aprilj.odom.com. So you can find almost everything about me there. You can also Google me. I've Googled myself a couple of times. I'm like, oh my God, all this stuff is on the internet about me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so aprilj.odom.com. I'm on Instagram, aprilj.odom. Uh, Facebook, April J. Odom, <laughs> and LinkedIn, April J. Odom. So I try to keep keep my name. Uh, someone a long time ago told me to get, get my name as a website, and I've just tried to keep the same. Yeah. And uh, I am planning NP Week again in November. So November 10th through 16th is going to be NP Week. Oh, uh, so that's exciting. I'm planning that. Uh, so I've just created a uh, nonprofit to help with that so that I could have a board and more help, uh, the Illinois Nurse Practitioner Network. So it's ilnpnetwork.org. Site is up. Uh, no events yet, but it's coming soon. Mm. Uh, and then, of course, if you're in Illinois and want to th- know anything about APR in practice, full practice authority, uh, you can catch me. I'm the president elect of ISAPN. And uh, in October, I'll be the president of ISAPN. And I love talking about full practice authority. <laughs> so uh, if you have any questions, definitely contact me and let me know. Mm. That's Awesome, April. I just love everything that you're doing. And thank you so much for sharing all of that. I'll be sure to include all that in the show notes so our listeners can find all the information that you had provided. And thank you again for all that you're doing for us nurses and for the community. Thank you so much, Valerie. Thank you.